Happy holidays, it's Peter Michaud. I'm one of the directors of the Piscataqua Decorative Arts Society and I'm here at the Exeter Congregational Church with Lynn Munro, who is the principal of Preservation Company in Kensington, New Hampshire, and also Stephen Mallory, who is the director of Historic Structures and Landscapes at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. And they're going to be leading us through a discussion and a tour of the interior of this church today. Okay, hi, I'm Lynn. And this is the Exeter Congregational Church, which was built in, uh, uh, you know, 1798-ish to 1800-ish, and designed by Ebenezer Clifford and Bradbury Johnson. So it is amazing. And we've just been exploring all of its beautiful interior finishes, and Peter's gonna show you the exterior on photographs later. Uh, it's really something, and so we have, we're lucky to have Stephen here because Stephen really understands these things. Anyway, I've been a member here for about 15 years, I guess, and we, I will help you when we talk about the sanctuary. But here's the thing. Okay, so, Stephen, this is, when you first came into this meeting house, and it was renowned for its size, uh, there wasn't a ceiling. It went up and up and up and up and up into this wonderful coved ceiling far, far above it. Um, and then there would have been galleries. We were just talking on that side. Not on that side, though, because that's where the pulpit would have been. And there's a magnificent pulpit window on that. It would have been on a, a tall hourglass with steps um, situation. Anyway, we'll show you the window later. Uh, and the original sounding board. And the original sounding board, yes. Yes, exactly. It, just spectacular. So. Um, any, anyway, we've just been talking about going from one wall to the other and how vast it would have been because these walls were added for Sunday school rooms. Um, and this was added, that whole addition was added to have a, 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 a kitchen and whatnot. So there's a whole other hunk of building that was appended. Um, and in 1840, again, they moved the sanctuary upstairs and uh, We'll show you that in a few minutes. But first, let's look at what's down here. Stephen, you want to say some things about that? Yeah, so this would have been the open main floor of the meeting house. Right. And again, two stories uh, uh, in the center with a gallery, uh, probably around three walls, uh, side walls and across the front, I'm assuming. Um, despite the fact that we're looking a little bit of scrambling of elements uh, and change because of the 19th century renovations, these wonderful columns that you're seeing interspersed around would have supported that gallery. And um, we have original 18th, early 19th century uh, uh, door architraves for the two side doors. This is all Ebenezer Clifford woodwork. And just a quick sidebar on Clifford. He's sort of the Exeter to Portsmouth version of Salem's Samuel McIntyre. And lived he was in, from Kensington. And lived in Kensington and he um, followed the same path of sort of carpenter, architect, uh, um, inventor, except I think he was maybe more hands-on than Samuel McIntyre at the same late stage of their career. Mac it seems like Clifford always was doing carving and actual building, whereas McIntyre moved more into design and stuff later in his career. Um, he also is the inventor of the diving bell whatever that is. <laughs> um, a lot of his earlier designs, the Georgian period stuff. And from Peter the, knows that, excuse me, Peter lived in the building where Ebenezer Clifford lived, he lived when for, he had the diving bell and the diving bell was part of Peter's tour. Yes, so, so it was, it was actually like an upside down barrel that could be used in, in more shallow waters to salvage um, cargo off of wrecks. And, and it was actually Oof. tested, and if you, if you do sort of newspaper searches, um, it was tested in a variety of different places along the eastern seaboard. Um, the bell was at one point, they believe, stored at the barn of the Gilman Garrison. It, it no longer, nobody and knows what happened what to it. What year would that have been? That would have been late, late 18th, early 19th century. Okay, because I've always wondered how the, uh, Henry Knox got the cannons out of the bottom of the Hudson River in the middle of the winter. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good but anyway, and that would be interesting. Wooden, the diving wooden, bell, the wooden goose that floated above. Right. So, so he carved a, a wooden goose float. So that's how you could communicate with 
um, oh, the, the ship above that you know the, the diving bell was being operated from so the divers could pull on the goose and tell them we're ready to come back up and so if you go to the Gilman Garrison today the the actual goose is in the house and part of the exhibit but then there's a replica of it that the last owner put up as a weather vane on top of the barn <laughs> oh wow okay wow okay. but we digress yes we digress <laughs> so, what did this building look like what was it like being in it when it yeah. was new well we know that there was an oh there were there was a two floor two level uh, uh around the, the sides these columns are really fascinating um and the 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 the, the, uh, the round ones, the you know the, the ones that are that are that are round in profile. These guys are all single log, lathe turned columns, um, and they probably are through board in the center, like all of the ones that I've ever seen that are out of context. They were bored through with a giant auger, so the wood wouldn't shrink and split. Um, the way to figure out, we know that when the second floor of this congregational, of the, when the congregation was moved to the second floor, they needed to hold up that floor with something. And the answer is, is that these col many of these columns that you see are not where they were in 1796 or in 98 or whatever, but where they were placed in the 1840s to support the floor. Now the way to figure out where, which ones are in their original locations and where they were you have to follow the parts of the frame that haven't moved, which would be the, the exterior wall framing. So we look at this column. This is actually square because it's a gigantic post that frames the uh, exterior wall. And if you look at that kind of fun, folksy molding profile, uh, at the, the, it's a capital, a country kind of capital, notice that on the round columns, it's the same profile, except they added some extra carving to make it interesting. So the columns that line up with exterior framing are likely in one capacity or another in their original location to support that gallery. Because um, you can see from here back to the back wall all the way over there, all of these guys line up. Um, and then notice that, and then these guys from this post, more or less, all the way across and into that children's room lineup. So we think that these would have all supported the gap, this, this part of the gallery. These were cut down. You can see that they're lower because there's some structural steel uh, uh, in there that was added at a later time. Um, and then notice that these, uh, these guys are slightly narrower in their profile. And they have a, a, a plain, uh, uh, a much more simplified um, kind of Doric-like capital to them. This would probably- so they might even be later. Might they be from the 1840s? I don't think so. I think that these are narrower and simpler is because these were the second floor version. Okay. They, they started here and went up a floor okay. um, and were moved down here to uh, support the middle span of the okay. added flooring. Um, another clue about what the exterior or what the layout and things of this uh, church might have been like is that the original dados are in place. And it looks like probably what? Maybe six inch or six foot intervals or maybe a little bit more. You see these fill ins in the dados. Here's one and here's one and here's one and they fall at regular intervals around the, these two exterior walls this one and the one on the other side and those give you the basic layout for the boxed pews that were underneath the gallery okay. and one of the things i think is interesting about clifford uh, the, that we all know is that he was renowned for the the detail his woodwork was so interesting right Extra. yeah it's very um the, the meticulousness of the craftsmanship is really what stands out. And, and um, period, period accounts talk about how this meeting house was, and, and that there were no finishes. It was not paint, it was unfinished plaster and, and, and these wonderful detailed woodwork things. And the best place to see that, why don't you come? <laughs> the best place to see that is on the sounding board, which is now where it, where it oughtn't be in the... Uh, Best 
them. And I'm, am I right in saying that that's essentially a maritime compass rose? It seems to be. <laughs> In examples of Ebenezer Clifford's surviving work that have survived over 200 and something years with no paint finishes on them, right. you see how unusually attentive he was to the quality of the cuts of wood that he chose and the tightness of his joinery. You can see, even though this has layers and layers of paint, there, are just, there aren't miter separations from shrinkage and movement. Uh, because the quality of the the, the, the the care behind the choosing of the materials and the drying of the materials and everything else was just really there. Right. And, and you might show them this one wonderful door in the backfield <laughs> before we move to the next. That center strap hinge is impressive. <laughs> okay, shall we? Shall we see what happened in 1840? Yeah. Oh, you should we, show them the buckets. We should point out the fire buckets because these are original to the church and, and just wonderful examples that say first parish. Maybe they'd like to see the Lincoln pew. <laughs> yes, and so next to the fire bucket we have Lincoln because behind us, <laughs> because he came to Exeter, his, his son was at Exeter, uh, was a student, and he came to visit and made one of his speeches from here. And this is the pew he sat in when he was at that church, which was another kind of, was the original first congregational church down near the academy. And this was removed when it was demolished in St. Peter's Day. But it matches the other pews, which you're going to see upstairs, because in 1840, of course, they put the next floor on. We'll go through that. I think that's Excellent. Okay. So did you know then if, um, uh, where um, Frederick Douglass would have given him his orations here in Exeter? Oh, probably, at the, probably in the town hall next door. Wouldn't you think, Peter? Yeah, although, what, what year was it that he... I don't know. He was everywhere all the time, and so it's likely that he was here more than once. Yeah, because before that town hall, it would be what, where the, the fire station, the old fire station is right. the old, or it's now the senior His center. His first major campaign in New Hampshire, New England, well, New England was 1841 to 45. So that would have been the old town hall if he came through then. And if no, they let no. him in. Yeah. Oh. Um, well, bef if before... You questions... Before we go up, I think you should... Oh, I should. Yes. <laughs> this, was, this was a, a lectern of some sort, he says. And there you can see uh, the original paint. <laughs> this would have been the color. We did enough paint tests upstairs to tell you that that's the p color of the pews. Uh, would have been. and um, For the 1840s, correct? Yes. Well, yes, that's right, because they were that color. Yes, that's right. Right, we have unfinished things earlier and... Green paint later. And then you were mentioning that the, the, the paint color was due to, to arsenic. Yep, it's called, it's, it was called in the time uh, a Paris green, and it's an arsenic-based paint that gives you that wonderful color that would have been much more dazzling originally. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it's in linseed oil and dark most of the time is why it's sort of gone to a more drab appearance, but it would have been mm -hmm. very, very brilliant originally. So what you're going to see upstairs <laughs> is nothing like it would have been this looks like it's, so it's made out of birch and white pine and the top is butternut. Interesting. Okay, we're headed upstairs. We are. Clifford was all, he, he also was a clock case maker. And I've been, I've, I've been told about Uh, that's just family history. There was one that came up at auction in, in the 70s, um, but there's no good photo of it. And 
Um, I think Roland Sawyer in his papers mentions that blah, 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 lady in town had an Ebenezer clock, but that was in the 40s, and who these, knows? These are, in fact, the original pulpit chairs, and, um, and these are the doors. So we're in 1840 now. Come on in. <laughs> Very similar painting to the Hampton Falls Church. So, and that is the uh, original pulpit. It was given to the Exeter Historical Society, but they were very kind to give it back when we renovated. Um, yeah, I mean, this is kind of the the city slicker version of what we saw in Kensington. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same form, that great semi elliptical bump in that allows the minister to stand more forward. Um, but this one is actually mahogany veneer as opposed to um, uh, uh, grain painting. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the lectern is, a, is upholstered, but that doesn't look like super early upholstery to me. And there are earlier tack lines along the edge. So this has been reupholstered at least one time or so. Interesting Kensington connection. The communion table was actually built by, uh, I forget his first name, Greenwood in Kensington. It's 20th century history, but but this was probably 1950s, given by one of the parishioners that built in Kensington, so there. Oh, neat. <laughs> in time, it too will be historic. And that historic photo that you have of the interior shows that, like Kensington, there were tour shares yes, on either side. Yes, and, and um, uh, yes, I have, I am hoping Peter can add some of that to it. Yes, um, definitely. Um, with the so so just to orient ourselves, if we were yes. downstairs, so you and I would be standing in one of the side galleries here, correct? Exactly. And the back gallery would have been on this wall here. Mm -hmm. The underneath the choir loft would have been the other side gallery, and then the pulpit would have been there. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. Lynn, is the window that's in the ladies' room in the back? Was that, is that an original piece that was moved out into That's the addition? That's correct. Okay. Yes, they moved, they moved the original pulpit window into the addition, so it's still on the exterior, but it's a different wall. They added a section for a kitchen and a um, other. And that was in the, the 1930s, you said, I think? 19, yes, 1940, I think. Oh. But, what's, but this is what is strange, Lynn. Was it moved? at another time first, because this fenestration is from 1840, and if you count the bays, the pulpit window would have not been here, it would have been where this window I, is. I completely agree. Because yeah, you have to go with the middle front window yep. back to where the pulpit was, unless it was offset. I'm trying to think, there is the, the, rocking, the Rocky Hill it, meeting it, house. Yeah. There you go. So it also would have been lower in the wall. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, just a minute. I'm just gonna go and look at something. I think it, well, let's go see the window. That's what he's going to look at, let's go. <laughs> okay, it is the window. Oh yeah. It's got the, 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 the secondary, um, the mullion that goes around, mm -hmm. and it's, it's the same window as in that picture. I know. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, I just remember it was being, so it was narrower, I think, than you're thinking, so that was worse. So here's the window. Yep, yep. This is the one that's in the picture. And then I'll just show everyone the photograph real quickly, showing that window in its original location. But the big question is, where is it from 1840 when that window goes in, and... 19, what did you say this edition's? No, I don't, 
I've always thought it was there until they moved it again, but maybe. Yeah, because. I don't know. I, don't, I never. I, I made assumptions that I should not make. Well, right. well, well, the photograph is in 18. I mean, so obviously it's, it's still in the wall when the photograph is, is taken. I wonder if it was a blind window. Oh, or it was moved down. That, no, no when I'm wrong. This is what happened. This is what fell down. Is I think that if we wanted to, because if this is the central window of the, of the front, the main front facade. Yep. So that wonderful arched window would be here except i think because of the photo let me take a look at it again so, so usually the pulpit window is is sits lower than the um the gallery windows i would have thought it would have been in, in that bay there no i think because if you're looking at one two is, three window one two yeah well and this is where we are is right we're standing inside the building right there and we're looking at that was a that was originally a window which became a door. One, two, three, yep. and then one, two. Th this window doesn't belong here. It had to have been moved in the in the uh, in the uh, when the addition was gone on because it backs up to the fireplace that's on the other side. So we know we've got so this guy. To your point, Peter, has to have been blinded because it would have been the top of it, the top of that arch would have been right here. Mm -hmm. Right? And it was there in the 18. And you, if you look in the photo, yeah. Notice, look, if you look really carefully at that photo, you get whitish. Oh, yeah. Whitish. You can see through the corner of those windows. And then this window is black. Yep. So it had been blinded. But it was moved, it was still there. Makes sense. Interesting. Mm. But it still doesn't explain why this window is here because it's out of. Well, unless if when they put the door in for the new addition on the back, they shifted this over here for whatever I reason. I think you're right because they also yeah yeah, I think you're right because the fireplace is on the that 1930s fireplace is on the other side. It was a big mess around. Well, they didn't scrap it. No. But we're asking where it was in between. Uh, the, the window? It was, it was in its original location. But blind. So in 1840, when they moved the floor up, they cut it off at the mid-span with, with this deck. They leave it on the outside as a blinded thing, and on the inside... Doesn't exist. You know what you've got to also wonder? Was this always a blind window? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is in its original location because it does line up with the front of the building. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that makes sense. What happened is they, they, the, the arch stays in place on the outside. It was, the top of it would have been right here. So they, in order to make the architecture of the interior make sense, mm -hmm. they put a false window in. Yep. And in order to make the architecture of the exterior make sense, they blinded and left in place the arch window. That's why we brought him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take any of this to the bank. <laughs> no, but it really, I, I, you know, as much as I've worked on this sanctuary. <laughs> that, well, and also and, I think we should probably mention what we were talking about a little bit earlier, too, is that the tray ceiling is likely an original feature. Would have been a plaster cone. Mm -hmm. um, these moldings that you see, which are the, the big crown molding that goes around the room, mm -hmm. and the light field in the middle of the room, to my surprise, I would have thought for the 18, they, they are from the 1840s renovation. They're, the profiles are right, the scale is right. I would have thought run in place molded plaster, but they're, they are actually all wooden. Mm. If you look really carefully, you can see the miter joints, uh, of, you know, where they've separated a little bit in the paint here and there. So pretty interesting. And Lynn, the, the sanctuary just recently got redecorated, correct? Mm -hmm. About 10 years ago. Yes, and we did some things to make it more functional for the 21st century. Huh. Um, 
Right. But, but, it's, we, we but it still moved, feels historic. Yeah, we removed the, the facing pews be, and created a stage at the front, and it's made it function much, 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 much better. Um, and created handicap access. That's not the right word these days. Barrier-free access. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you both once again for not only giving us tours of one church, but two churches. Um, this has been delightful, and it's been fun to explore, especially this one, which, you know, in spite of all the changes, still has a lot of integrity in, in those layers that, mm. that show its history and, and its original craftsmanship. Which was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. So <laughs> yeah, and it, it's a puzzle that is fun to read. You know, mm -hmm. what the, the other church was really fun because you get a true, you know, fly in amber essentially. But this, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, but but this one, it's kind of fun when you just want to check out and uh, listening to the sermon, you can sort of figure out what the church. Is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well. Thank you so much, and Thank we, you, Pierre. <laughs> we will hopefully see everyone live sometime in 2021. Cool. Awesome.